Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back in Dromore again and see so many friendly faces and familiar faces. Uh, we have quite a few announcements here. You must be very busy people in Dromore. Oh, you always have been, no oh, <laughs> Right. Well, uh, Holy Communion this morning, so we hope you'll all join in the celebration of it. Uh, and you can, if you would rather not receive the wine from the common cup, that's okay. Choir practice on Wednesday night at Wednesday the 20th of March at 8 o'clock. Sunday the 24th of March, 11 a.m. morning service with GFS and CLB enrollment and Harry Anderson will be the preacher. And then the Mother's Union would like to invite the parish to their open visitors evening on Thursday the 21st of March at 8 p.m. Guests, the Reverend Kyle and Elliot Hanlon from Wood and Weave are demonstrating basket weaving. There will also be a bring and buy sale and Elliot will have a selection of his crafts for sale. For catering purposes, please let Evelyn know if you plan to attend. That's on Thursday night at 8 o'clock. Now, from Wednesday, to, from Wednesday the 10th of April, we will be doing the prayer course at our Bible study, kindly facilitated by Carl Saunders. Everyone is very welcome at 8 p.m. in the committee room. And there's a short promotional video now, so watch the screens. it. So I, I would highly recommend, I'd hi, highly commend that uh, course to you. Uh, prayer is key to growth in the Christian life and especially in your personal walk with God. So the more you can learn about prayer, the better. And if you are aged 17 to 55 and would be eligible to become a stem cell donor, please attend an event in Denimona Primary School on Saturday, 28th of March, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., to help Tracy McKenna, a young mother of two who needs an urgent stem cell transplant. The process is simple. Cheek, the process is a simple cheek swab. The Reverend Andrew and Joanne Quill are making a short video call after this service this morning while they are in Juba, which is in uh, South Sudan. And everyone is welcome to join us in the conference room for that short video call from Andrew and Joanne. Tea and coffee after the service. We hope that you will continue in fellowship with us over a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. I think that that's all the announcements. There's a right for you. are making me work hard here this morning. So, we come... Oh, there's another one. Seven Towers Male Voice Choir, Bellamina, concert in the church on Saturday the 6th of April at 8pm. Tickets, £10, available from Vestu members. That's the Seven Towers Male Voice Choir from Bellamina on Saturday the 6th of April at 8 p.m. Thank you. So if you turn to our, our, we turn to our order of service now and in a moment we'll sing our opening hymn. And this, this is a beautiful hymn. This is In Christ Alone. Uh, this is probably the most popular hymn in the Christian charts, 
and is written by a man called Stuart Turnen and the music by a, a, a fellow called uh, Getty, Keith Getty. But it, it's unique, this hymn, in that nearly every line covers a verse of Scripture. Nearly every line of this hymn. So it's important as you sing these hymns to really think about the words what the words mean, because they're often maybe very devotional or maybe they're a prayer. But in this hymn, the, the writers cover the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the implications of this in our lives. And this morning, we're going to think about the resurrection of Jesus. And, you know, through the resurrection, we can find strength and hope and comfort because Jesus is our all in all. And it doesn't matter what problem you face in life, what the a crisis is, a Christ will sustain us. Christ will see us through. So as we sing this hymn, really think deeply about the words, in Christ alone.
Let us pray. <coughs> the Colic for Purity. Almighty God, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to intercede for us in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us affirm our trust in God's mercy and confess that we need forgiveness. We'll have a moment or two for silent prayer. We're reminded that we do sin in thought, word, and deed, and we invite the Holy Spirit to come and search our hearts and just reveal to us any unconfessed sin that we may have or any wrong attitudes we may have towards anyone or any unforgiveness. So we spend a moment or two in silence when we ask the good Lord to forgive us. He says if we do confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us, in the silence, confess our sins to God. Father, you come to meet us when we return to you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, you died on the cross for our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy Spirit, you give us life and peace. <coughs> Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And a colleague for the fifth Sunday in Lent. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, granted by faith in him, who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll have our first reading now from 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, 
and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, <coughs> as to one abnormally born. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Hear the Gospel of our Saviour Christ, according to St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, beginning at verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Going to sing our second hymn, and again, this is a very old hymn, it's a resurrection hymn, Lo in the Grave He Lay.
let us pray. Lord, we thank you for everyone in this building this morning. We just ask you to move amongst us in the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray you'll just open our ears to hear your word and soften our hearts to respond to it. But above all, Lord, take my lips, speak your word through them, and we pray what we share will give glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In a few weeks' time, all over the world, Christians will celebrate the, re- the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, the death and resurrection form the cornerstone of the Christian faith. They are vitally important. It's important that we fully understand his death and why he died and his resurrection. In the gospel read, er, sorry, in the epistle this morning, taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says that the gospel and the Christian faith would be useless if Jesus hadn't come back from the dead. He says, and if Christ had not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If there were no resurrection, there would be no point in us being here this morning. All the preaching in the world would be useless and our faith would be useless without the resurrection of Jesus. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 is the great chapter in the Bible on the resurrection. We only read a short portion of it this morning. I would suggest that when you go home, read it. I would suggest you reread it. Spend a week in 1 Corinthians. Corinthians 15, if you want to learn more about the resurrection. Because in that chapter, Paul gives a terrific defense of the resurrection of Jesus and its importance to the Christian faith. The gospel message that Paul had preached to the Corinthians was that they that the message that they had received on which they had taken their stand was the message that had saved them. It was through the preaching of the resurrection that they'd come to a personal faith in Christ. Paul wanted to remind them of that gospel because some of them, through the preaching of false teachers, and there are many false teachers about today, had come to believe there was no resurrection of the dead. This is what they were preaching. And many people, even within the church, church leaders, will say there was no physical resurrection. They deny that. But without that belief, as Paul says, our faith is useless. Paul said, for what I have received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Firstly, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. How important the Scriptures are. We need to read them, mark them, learn them, and inwardly digest them. Because it's within the Scriptures that we learn all about God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are vital. They're so important. And without the truth of this message, Christ's death was worthless. However, Jesus, as the sinless Son of God, remembered Jesus was unique. He was both God and man. 
He was the sinless Son of God, and he went to that cross. He took your punishment and my punishment for our sins by dying on that cross at Calvary. There he shed his precious blood so that those who believe in him and confess their sins can be washed clean by that precious blood and have their sins removed. Secondly, Jesus was buried. The fact of his death is revealed in the fact of his burial. Jesus did die on the cross. Jesus was buried in a tomb. And thirdly, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus had quoted the prophet Jonah, for as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Paul then goes on to say that many witnesses saw and met the risen Christ. There's all the proof we need that Christ did rise. And Paul here reminds us that Peter saw, the 12 apostles saw, 500 people saw him at the one time. James, our Lord's brother, saw him. And then at his ascension, the old witness is ascending back to heaven again. And Paul says, last of all, he met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. Paul, who was having the Christians arrested, put in prison, and put to death, met the risen Christ, and he was utterly transformed. And he went on to become the greatest Christian missionary of all time. And you know, if the resurrection didn't happen, all these so-called witnesses, they were liars. Why did so many of the early Christians die for their faith? And some of them died horrible deaths. The resurrection would have to be real for them to give their lives for it. So, what does the resurrection mean for each of us? Well, it gives all who believe in Jesus the power of eternal life. We have already quoted in our service, John 3, 16, for God so loves the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus, the creed reminds us, we'll say the Nicene Creed this morning, but it also reminds us that Jesus died and rose again. We say in, it, in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body. We say that every Sunday we meet. It's there in the creed. And the creeds are vitally important because they're a summary of all we believe. And we should say them every time we meet. But the resurrection, I don't know about you, but the resurrection means so much to me. And it meant so much to Sheila and I 28 years ago. This is St. Patrick's Day, but we can't celebrate St. Patrick. 28 years ago, our youngest son was drowned in a surfing accident. And I just want to share a little bit about that experience. And through that experience, how God proved his faithfulness. I suggested that you really need to read, you know, your Bible on a daily basis. Because the Bible's full of promises. 
And when we face crisis, those promises are so important. But also with the Bible goes prayer, and that's why you need to learn more about prayer and pray on a regular basis. Pray with others, it's so important. But God is a God who not only hears our prayers, but he answers our prayers. And that's really exciting in the Christian faith. I've been ordained for over 40 years. I'm now 81 years of age. And the Christian life has become more exciting than it ever was. And it's all happened through these experiences of life where God has proved his faithfulness to his promises and not only answering our prayers. And we hear God speak to us in it's probably about three ways. We hear him speak to us, the Bible tells us, through dreams, through visions, maybe through other people telling us something. But the most common way he speaks to us is through his word. So that's why it's important to know the word and to know the promises when you face crisis in your life. Now, we face this crisis, many others of you have faced maybe similar, and you face death at all times. But I want to tell you a little bit about David and how God proved his faithfulness through him and through his death to us. He was our third son. He, uh, he was at school in Belfast. He went to Belfast instant. He was in his last year there, and we were appoint, or I was appointed rector of uh, our days. And uh, back, I think it was just before, in December time. And anyway, he decided to stay on at Inns to finish off his A-levels and so on. We had a house at, out at, on a hill near Hillsborough. And he was able to live there and travel into school each day. And we moved down to uh, Kesh. But we got, we become a bit worried about him. He'd been a good Christian and he'd gone to church and so on, but he'd started to fall away. He'd started to drink and party and all that jazz. But anyway, we left him there. But when we were down in Kesh, the Lord laid it in my heart to pray for him five minutes a day that he would come back to the Lord. And... I, uh, I pray in tongues as a gift you receive when you're filled with the Spirit. If you want to read about it, you'll read about it in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and, four, uh, and 14, 1 Corinthians 14, where it tells us to, to desire earnestly the spiritual gifts. And Paul says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. And at the end of it, he says, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. It can be controversial. But for me, it's a great aid in prayer. It's a heavenly language that when you run out of your own words, you can really uh, switch to tongues and really praise and glorify God. But anyway, I was led to pray five minutes a day in tongues for David that he would return to a uh, the Lord. And uh, I did that faithfully. Then the next thing, uh, our eldest boy announced he was getting married out in Australia. So we started to make arrangements with that. But David said he wasn't interested in going to Australia. He wasn't going. So anyway, Sheila and I, we booked our tickets and so on and uh, for Australia. But then things changed. It was just after David's A-levels, that he uh, came down to Kesh, and he and the youth pastor, his son, they went out, they did a little pub crawl around Kesh, and he came home drunk, and he was quite sick. It was about three o'clock in the morning, he was being sick in the toilet. Sheila went and said, what were you doing? He says, I was out enjoying myself. But she says, are you enjoying yourself now? And he said, no, not really. So anyway, the next day, indeed, or shortly after, he changed. He said he, he wanted to go to Australia. And so he had to go off and uh, book his ticket. And 
so on. So anyway, he went out to Australia. And, but out in Australia, he had, a, he had a wonderful experience. Our son was on a large missionary base there, about 500 young people. And David became involved with them, you know, before the wedding. And he really liked the young boys there. The, many of them were from places like Samoa and Fiji and the other islands there and Southeast Asia. And, well, they were from all over the world, but a lot of them were there. But he got into their company and he really enjoyed their company. Back in Ballybean, the boys he had mixed with there, they were very full of sarcasm, they were very critical, very judgmental, and all this putting each other down, and this put them off Christianity quite a bit. But here, these boys were very positive, they were very infirming, they were very encouraging, and uh, God was real. God was real to these lads. So he decided then he would take a year out from school, or from university, and do what's called a discipleship training course. You have three months study on the base and then three months outreach. So anyway, during this time, his exam results come through and he did pretty well in his exams. So we had to ring through to Belf to Queens and so on and arrange him to take a year out. So that was all arranged. And anyway, he went off, he started the course and all and we returned to Ireland. And it was transforming the course. We got letters saying that he had come back to God, the Bible had become real, and uh, so on. And he uh, even wrote letters to his teachers asking them to forgive them for things maybe he'd done, he had done wrong at school. And wrote to other people, and, you know, to ask them for forgiveness. It was real character building, but God become real to him and the Bible become real and so on. And anyway, after three months, he went, went on his outreach to Thailand and then Vietnam. But in Vietnam, uh, towards the end of his time there, he took very ill uh, with dysentery and he had to be hospitalized. He was on a drip and so on, just shortly before he returned to Australia. And then when he returned to Australia, there were just, uh, everything was coming to an end on the course, and the people were preparing to return to their respective homes and so on. And then a local church, uh, three hours south of Perth, invited them down for a weekend and barbecue and so on. So he went down on that, and then... I don't know why, but they took, him, took them to a very remote place. There was a terrific surfing place right beside where the church was. But I mean, they took them away to this very scenic place, lovely place. But you had to travel through a forest to get to it. When we went to visit, we had to hire a four before to get into it. But anyway, they took them there. There were no lifeguards, no safety precautions, no nothing. But anyway, he hadn't regained his full strength. He was a good swimmer as were some of the others. But as they were put, putting their boards, or clipping their boards on, a rip caught them and pulled them away out. Well, he just was not at his full strength. So the rip pulls you out, and then it pulls you way down uh, the sea forever so far. But anyway, they, they rescued them. But anyway, they worked, but he was dead. But you couldn't even get an ambulance in to work, work with them. So anyway, he was dead. The others... Uh, survived, the other three survived. But of course, when that happens, that's a huge blow. But we had the consolation to know he'd returned to the Lord, he was serving the Lord. And John's gospel tells us, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, we believe that, that he'd gone to be with the Lord. But grief is grief. It's a loss. You have to go, whole, go through the whole process of grieving. And it is very therapeutic to do that. But believe it or not, you think, I'm a clergyman and there'd be lots of help from other clergy, but there was no help. 
It was just God, like the words of the next hymn we'll sing. I call out to you again and again. We called out to God in prayer. And the psalmist tells us that God is close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those those who are crushed in spirit. And again, in another psalm, it tells us he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. And we called out to God, called out to God. And then the next thing, this was a few months down the line, we started to get these lovely flowers in the post, come from England. Then we got lovely worship tapes. Worship music is very therapeutic. It's very healing at the time of grief. But the Lord was answering our prayers. He had raised up a lovely couple in England, the Church of England clergyman and his wife. The hearty news. He had a connection with Castle Archdale. He was an Archdale. He was of that line. And anyway, then a, a retreat come for clergy and pastors who had crisis in their lives, a 10-day retreat. They sent us our air tickets. They paid for the retreat and the accommodation. God, again, you see, he's so faithful. He answered our prayers. We went on that retreat. And indeed, that was the, you know, the beginning of the healing of the, 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 great, the, the, the great loss. And uh, it, it, each morning we had a time of worship and then you, there was counsel and other times. But she had been really praying that, you know, God would speak to her at, at that conference, which he did. Because there was a hymn or a song that David liked and uh, we got the words. It it hadn't been released in Britain. It was only released in Australia. And we got the words sent over and somebody sang it at his funeral service. But this man at the time of worship felt he had a word from the Lord for somebody present. And it was Jesus, lover of my soul. And Sheila didn't respond immediately. Then he said again, it's for somebody uh, that, you know, gone through loss. And it's Jesus, Jesus, lover of my soul. Not the old hymn, a new song. And this was a song that was sung at David's funeral. And God was speaking words of encouragement to Sheila. Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, I'll never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon the rock. And now I know I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My saviour, my closest friend, I'll worship you until the very end. And God wonderfully spoke to Sheila through that. Then at the end of the time, people prayed over us, words of prophecy. And for me, the man had never met me, knew nothing about me. And he said, I was like a broken teapot, but God was going to take me and piece me together again. And we returned home. We were uh, uh, back to parish life and about wonderful support in the parish, of course. And uh, then it was some time later, I was away preaching at a harvest down south. And coming back, I always remember it was at, just at the manor house, lovely moonlight night. And I wasn't even thinking about David, but I had a, I had a song on the a cassette in the, on the, in the car. And I wasn't listening to the words. But at that point, this beautiful picture of David flashed in my mind. The happiest David had ever seen in my life. 
And the words of the song just jumped out at me. And the were, if you could see me now, I'm walking streets of gold. If you could see me now, I'm standing tall and whole. If you could see me now, you'd know I've seen his face. If you could see me now, you'd know the pains are raised. You wouldn't want me to ever leave this place if you could only see me now. And that was just God assuring us that David was in heaven, that he was with the Lord. And that's the way the Lord speaks to you when you walk close to him in prayer and through the Bible study and, 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 and so on. And I'm sharing this to encourage you to really get into the Bible, to get into God's promise, to really get into prayer, to really walk close with God, to give your life to God. Because, you know, down the line, we're going to face persecution. I mean, Christians all over the world have been persecution, and persecution's coming. And we need God's strength. We need God's presence with us all the time. And we need that assurance that when we die we will go to be with the Lord. But the most remarkable thing happened was just a couple of years ago. I was going to visit some people, and usually when they come out of the state where I live, I would turn left. But when I got to the T-junction, I said, oh, I must go up by the church. I think there's a wedding tomorrow and there's flowers in the grave. Now, not that I usually go to the grave because he's not in the grave his body is but his spirit's with the Lord so I thought maybe the flowers were dead so I drove up we she just maybe drove up to the church this just a couple of years ago and this is God again how he you know gives you assurance I had been thinking about David and I was wondering about his friends. David was going to study medicine and uh, there was about eight other boys in his form going to do the same. They were all at his funeral. And I was wondering, I was saying, God, would any of those boys be thinking about David now? Well, anyway, we drove up to the church where the grave is and looked out the flowers were all right, but then we noticed a bunch of flowers and a card lying on the grave. We'd met a man walking down from the grave. And uh, anyway, when I got out of the car and lifted a bunch of flowers, he came walking back up again. And he says to me, I put those flowers there. I knew David. And I said, well, look, I'm his fa- I, I, I said, I'm his father. And so on, and then I asked him his name, and he told me it was Andrew. And, I said, Andrew, what are you doing now? He says, I'm a cardiologist. I was working in the hospital in Enniskillen, but my wife won't come to live in Fermanagh, poor woman. And uh, I've got a position in the Ulster in Belfast, so I'm going up there. But I come out to see the grave and to leave the flowers. And then when we went home, we read his car. And he had written the following. Dear David, I know you are with the Lord now. I don't understand why you died so young when you loved the Lord so much in your final year. I missed getting to see you come back home to share your faith at Queen's with me. I was so glad to get your uh, letters about your time in YWAM. They really encouraged me. I will miss you. We will meet again when the Lord calls me home, your friend, Andrew. And I mean, that was remarkable. That, that, that was no coincidence that I should dri- drive that way, which I didn't normally, and that he should be there at that time. But that's God. That's the way he works. God is real. He hears our prayers. He answers our prayers. He loves us. And all we need to do is to confess our sins, be washed in that precious blood as we talked about earlier, 
and enter into a personal relationship with him. There's no need to be afraid. There's no need to think you're going to become a fanatic or anything like that. God created us because he loves us and he wants us to spend eternity with him. That's why he wrote the Bible. The Bible's a love letter from God to us. And that's why he gives us a discipline of prayer so we can talk to us and we can hear him talk to us. So I would encourage you, if you haven't taken that step of faith, don't hesitate to do so. See somebody as soon as possible and surrender your life to God. And no matter what crisis you face in life, he will be with you. He will be that rock, that fortress, that deliverer who will see you through this. Next hymn that we're going to sing is number two there. Faithful one, so unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace. Lord of all, I depend on you. I call out to you again and again. I call out to you again and again. You are my rock in times of trouble. And we have proved that time and again. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. What words? Written by a man with six children, two children severely retarded. And you know how difficult it is to look after them and how tiring it is. But that's his words, how he called out to God and how God seen him through the storm and lifted him up. Do turn to God and he will see you through all the storms of life. So let us stand and sing that beautiful hymn and think of the words, make it your prayer, Faithful one, so unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace.
say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we pray for the church worldwide. Grant that every member of your church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. And we pray for peace in Ukraine and Gaza and Israel. We pray for the leaders of those places, Lord, that you'll grant them your wisdom at this time. You'll grant unity to the governments. But above all, Lord, we pray for your church in Ukraine and Gaza and in Israel, that you'll strengthen your church, Lord, that you'll grant your church unity, that you'll fill your people with the Holy Spirit and use your church as a mighty witness to you in the midst of all the 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 war and uh, all the terrorism and destruction. Lord, give them real boldness to declare your word. Use them to serve the people of Ukraine, Gaza, and Israel, and even get alongside them and then be able to present the gospel to them. But strengthen your church in these countries, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray for this parish. We thank you for all the families that belong to this parish, Lord. We thank you how you've been working here over the years. But we pray now during this interregnum for all the visiting preachers that they'll bring your word to the people here. But we pray in particular, Lord, for the nominators, the bishop and the diocesan nominators, and specifically for the parish nominators. I don't know their names. You probably know the names. So lift up in particular the parish nominators to the Lord. Ask him, pour a spirit out upon them, to lead them and guide them in the decisions they have to make and so on. Grant them a unity. 
But above all, Lord, there must be a, a, a person out there who would be interested in this parish. Raise up the p- person, lay it on their hearts, the needs of this parish, and lead their nominators towards that person. But work in the hearts of the nominators at this time, Lord. Lead them to that person that you have set aside to lead this parish on to greater things. Lord, in your mercy. Lastly, we pray for the sick, those known to us, those sick at home, those lonely or depressed at home, or maybe those sick in hospital. Again, a moment or two in silence, lift up your sick friends to the Lord. Stretch out, stretch out your hand to bring healing to those who are sick, comfort for those who mourn, and hope for those in despair. And accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name, thy kingdom come, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we say together the prayer of humble access. And this is a prayer of preparation before we come to the Lord's table. We do not presume this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy to to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. And we'll sing our offertory hymn, which is the great hymn, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son, endless is the victory thou or death has won. And again, think deeply about the words. This again was written by a man after his wife died. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son.
Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Let us pray. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, Lord of all creation, we praise you for your goodness and your love. When we turned away, you did not reject us. You came to meet us in your Son, welcomed us as your children, and prepared a table where we might feast with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened what? Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, on the night before you died, you came to table with your friends. Taking bread, you gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, you are the bread of life. At the end of supper, you took the cup, give thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we bless you. You are the true vine. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Holy Spirit, giver of life, Come upon each one of us now. May this bread and wine be to us a remembrance of the body and blood of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. As we eat and drink these, make us who know our need of grace, one in Christ, our risen Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessed Trinity, with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of thanks and praise and lift our voice to join the song of heaven, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to you, our God, for your gift beyond words. Amen, amen, amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We, being many, one body, we all share in the one bread. Draw near with faith, Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Remember that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Dear Lord, we ask your blessing upon this young man. Bless him in body. Amen. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.